Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of 3001 The Final Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. So this is the fourth or third? Fourth book in the uh, Space Odyssey series. And um, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... The body of Frank Poole, lost for a thousand years since the computer Hal caused his death en route to Jupiter, is retrieved, revived, and enhanced. In the most eagerly awaited sequel of all time, the terrifying truth of the monolith's mission is a mystery only Poole can resolve. Now, I don't know if this is the most eagerly awaited sequel of all time. I mean, I would throw the final Harry Potter book in the mix there. But anyway, so we get this um, fictitious asteroid, but it's interesting because this could happen. And it makes a good argument as well. The millions dead from the tsunami caused by the Pacific asteroid in 2304, how ironic that a land impact would have done much less damage, had reminded all future generations that the human race had too many eggs in one fragile basket. We get a reference to the Millennium, the Millennium Committee project and everyone being heartily sick of all the events planned to celebrate the end of the 2000s. And I sure assume that was, um, you know, the same as what was happening at the end of the 1000s when uh, there was the, the Millennium then. So I assume that's what uh, Clark was basing it on. We get this little line, which I think is true, but also sad. It says, um, uh, however, as it grew clearer and stronger, it began to give the signature of a metallic object, perhaps a couple of meters long. It was traveling on an orbit heading out of the solar system. So it was almost certainly, Chandler decided, one of the myriad pieces of space junk that mankind had tossed toward the stars during the last millennium, and which might one day provide the only evidence that the human race had ever existed. Um, then he figures out what it is, so we get this end of the chapter. Goliath here, Chandler radioed earthwards, his voice tinged with pride as well as solemnity. We're bringing aboard a thousand year old astronaut, and I can guess who it is. It's a familiar face. Good old Frank Paul is coming home. And so, Frank Paul is, he comes around and he's trying to figure out, like, a thousand years have passed, what has changed? His present surroundings had obviously been carefully programmed. He wondered if there was the equivalent of a television screen somewhere. How many channels would the fourth millennium have? But could see no sign of any controls near his bed. There was so much he would have to learn in this new world. He was a savage who had suddenly encountered civilization. But first he must regain his strength and learn the language. Not even the advent of sound recording, already more than a century old when Paul was born, had prevented major changes in grammar and pronunciation. And there were thousands of new words, mostly from science and technology, though often he was able to make a shrewd guess at their meaning. More frustrating, however, were the myriad of famous and infamous personal names which had accumulated over the millennium and which meant nothing to him. For weeks, until he had built up a data bank, most of his conversations had to be interrupted with potted biographies. And I find it kind of interesting that he kind of nailed seeing those changes, but didn't see like the diversification of media to the point at which we don't really have more TV channels than we used to. We just, we watch YouTube and Netflix and stuff now. Oh, and so, um... The computers he finds are like too simple to get his date of birth because obviously it's, it's a thousand years ago. So uh, they've moved it up a thousand years, which I thought was funny. And Indra says to him, didn't you have a saying, you ain't seen anything yet? Nothing, he corrected absentmindedly. Although you ain't seen anything yet would be correct English. Uh, and there's some cool stuff on times as well, time zones. Paul checked the time on the elaborate wristband whose functions he was still exploring. One minor surprise had been that the whole world was now on universal time. The confusing patchwork of time zones had been swept away by the advent of global communications. There had been much talk of this back in the 21st century, and it had even been suggested that solar should be replaced by sidereal time. Side real time. Then, during the course of the year, the sun would move right around the clock, setting at the time it had risen six months earlier. And I thought this was funny, given that I control my TV with my Google Home. Um, Paul was both astonished and delighted when the television set was wheeled into the room and positioned at the end of his bed. Delighted because he was suffering from mild information starvation, and astonished because it was a model which had been obsolete even in his own time. We've had to promise the museum we'll give it back, Matron informed him, and expect you now to use this. As he fondled the remote control, Paul felt a wave of acute nostalgia sweep over him. As few other artifacts could, it brought back memories of his childhood and the days when most television sets were too stupid to understand spoken commands. So uh, Paul, he says to himself, someone once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, it was Arthur C. Clarke himself who said that. He quotes himself a lot in his, in his books, like his characters referencing that particular quote, which always makes me chuckle. We get a reference to a petabyte being, um, so that's what, a thousand terabytes or a million gigabytes. Uh, and they said that's enough to record anything any person can experience during one lifetime. Which actually doesn't sound like that much, really. We get this fun little bit as well. Um, 
Um, you said that all the old religions have been discredited. So what do people believe nowadays? As little as possible. We're all either deists or theists. You've lost me. Definitions, please. They were slightly different in your time, but here are the latest versions. Theists believe there's not more than one god. Deists but that there is not less than one god. I'm afraid the distinction is too subtle for me. Not for everyone. You'd be amazed at the bitter controversies it's aroused. Five centuries ago, someone used what's known as surreal mathematics to prove there's an infinite number of grades between theist and deist. Of course, like most dabblers with infinity, he went insane. We got a reference to an old joke. Uh, Would you trust your kids to a dinosaur? What? And risk injuring it? And he's kind of stuck in space. He's, he's not strong enough to go down to Earth because he's not used to the, the Earth's gravity anymore. Uh, and we get a little bit about that here and also just the kind of demands on Paul's time, bearing in mind obviously he's a very important figure in society because of what he's been through and, and survived. To a large extent, he was the master of his own time, out of a sense of duty and gratitude. He acceded to as many requests as he could from scientists, historians, writers and artists working in media that were often incomprehensible to him. He also had countless invitations from other citizens of the Four Towers, virtually all of which he was compelled to turn down. Most tempting and most hard to resist were those that came from the beautiful planet spread out below. Of course, Professor Anderson had told him, you'd survive if you went down for a short time with the right life support system, but you wouldn't enjoy it. And it might weaken your neuromuscular system even further. It's never really recovered from that thousand year sleep. His other garden, Indra Wallace, protected him from unnecessary intrusions and advised him which requests he should accept and which he should politely refuse. By himself, he would never understand the socio-political structure of this incredibly complex culture, but he soon gathered that, although in theory all class distinctions had vanished, there were a few thousand super citizens. George Orwell had been right. Some would always be more equal than others. And I like this as a vegan as well. Um, they're eating dinner. Um, and we get, corpse food was on the way out even in your time, Anderson explained. Raising animals to uh, eat them became economically impossible. I don't know how many acres of land it took to feed one cow, but at least 10 humans could survive on the plants it produced, and probably 100 with hydroponic techniques. But what finished the whole horrible business was not economics, but disease. It started first with cattle, then spread to other food animals, a kind of virus, I believe, that affected the brain and caused a particularly nasty death. Although a cure was eventually found, it was too late to turn back the clock. And anyway, synthetic foods were now far cheaper and you could get them in any flavour you liked. And the uh, asteroid in 2304 wiped out several percent of the world's information banks, despite all backups and safety systems. And Paul is thinking, he can't help wondering if among all the exabytes that were retrievably lost, with the records of his own children, even now his descendants of the 30th generation might be walking the earth. But he would never know. We get a reference to the fact that missiles made of ice can generate temperatures in the tens of thousands of degrees. Uh, it actually goes hotter than the sun. We get a thing called the Thought Writer where you can write with your thoughts basically. Um, and it's written in this kind of vernacular there as well. Um, Hope I can get my old unit fixed. Know all my shortcuts and abreaves. Maybe should get psychoanalyzed like in your time. Never understood how that Freudian, mean Freudian haha nonsense lasted as long as it did. Reminds me, came across late 20th diff another day, may amuse you, something like this quote, Psychoanalysis, contagious disease originating Vienna circa 1900, now extinct in Europe but occasional outbreaks among rich Americans, unquote. Funny? Some fun stuff here, still on that thought reader, writer thing. Um, <clears throat> talking about Ted Kahn, he's still famous back on earth for at least two of his sayings. Civilization and religion are incompatible, and faith is believing what you know isn't true. Actually, I don't think the last one is original. If it is, that's the nearest he ever got to a joke. He never cracked a smile when I tried one of my favourites on him. Hope you haven't heard it before. It obviously dates from your time. The Dean's complaining to his faculty. Why do you scientists need such expensive equipment? Why can't you be like the maths department, which only needs a blackboard and a waste paper basket? Better still, like the Department of Philosophy. That doesn't even need a waste paper basket. And we get Dr. Khan here, he says, You may have heard me called an atheist, but that's not quite true. Atheism is unprovable, so uninteresting. Equally, however unlikely it is, we can never be certain that God once existed and has now shot off to infinity where no one can ever find him, like Gautama Buddha. I take no position on this subject. My field of interest is the psychopathology known as religion. And I want to continue along with this. Uh, psychopathology? That's a harsh judgment. Amply justified by history. Imagine that you're an intelligent extraterrestrial concerned only with verifiable truths. You discover a species which has divided itself into thousands, no, by now millions, of tribal groups holding an incredible variety of beliefs about the origin of the universe and the way to behave in it. Although many of them have ideas in common, even when there's 99% overlap, the remaining 1% is enough to set them killing and torturing each other over trivial points of doctrine, utterly meaningless to outsiders. 
How to account for such irrational behaviour? Lucretius hit it on the nail when he said that religion was the byproduct of fear, a reaction to a mysterious and often hostile universe. For much of human prehistory, it may have been a necessary evil, but why was it so much more evil than necessary? And why did it survive when it was no longer necessary? I said evil, and I mean it, because fear leads to cruelty. The slightest knowledge of the Inquisition makes one ashamed to belong to the human species. One of the most revolting books ever published was The Hammer of Witches, written by a couple of sadistic perverts and describing the tortures the church authorised, encouraged, to extract confessions from thousands of harmless old women before it burned them alive. The Pope himself wrote an approving foreword. That's the Malaeus Maleficarum, I believe. But most of the other religions, with a few honourable exceptions, were just as bad as Christianity. Even in your century, little boys were kept chained and whipped until they'd memorised whole volumes of pious gibberish and robbed of their childhood and manhood to become monks. Perhaps the most baffling aspect of the whole affair is how obvious madmen, century after century, would proclaim that they, and they alone, had received messages from God. If all the messages had agreed, that would have settled the matter, but of course they were wildly discordant, which never prevented self-styled messiahs from gathering hundreds, sometimes millions, of adherents who would fight to the death against equally deluded believers of a microscopically differing faith. Savage, Dr. Khan. I love it. And we get this cracking bit as well. Uh, there's never been anything, however absurd, that countless people weren't prepared to believe, often so passionately that they'd fight to the death rather than abandon their illusions. To me, that's a good operational definition of insanity. And to me, that reminds me of, like, um, you know, what we see happening at the moment with climate change denial and, you know, Trump's election was stolen and the Pizzagate thing or whatever, where there were... Hillary Clinton was having satanic rituals underneath pizza parlors or whatever it was. I love this little exchange here because I relate to this because I, I agree with the sentiment. Do you believe in ghosts, Dim? Certainly not, but like every sensible man, I'm afraid of them. Why do you ask? And I thought this was fun as well. Illogical though it seemed, most of the human race had found it impossible not to be polite to its artificial children, however simple-minded they might be. Whole volumes of psychology as well as popular guides, how not to hurt your computer's feelings, artificial intelligence, real irritation, were two of the best-known titles, had been written on the subject of man-machine etiquette. Long ago, it had been decided that however inconsequential rudeness to robots might appear to be, it should be discouraged. All too easily, it could spread to human relationships as well. And it reminds me of Shay, she's very polite to Google. But I think part of that as well is the fear of if there's a robot uprising, maybe they'll remember the people who are nice to them. Just a beautiful paragraph here at the start of Fire in the Deep. For millions of years it had been an ocean world, its hidden waters protected from the vacuum of space by a crust of ice. In most places the ice was kilometres thick, but there were lines of weakness where it had cracked open and torn apart. Then there had been a brief battle between two implacably hostile elements that came into direct contact on no other world in the solar system. The war between sea and space always ended in the same stalemate. The exposed water simultaneously boiled and froze, repairing the armour of ice. Just a line, whenever we invent something clever we find that Mother Nature's already thought of it. Which is very true. So Frank ends up having a conversation with Hal, and obviously Hal is the computer that killed him years ago. And we get this old bit. I guess I'm still in a state of shock. First of all, how should I feel about someone who tried to, who did kill me, even if it was a thousand years ago? But I understand now that Hal wasn't to blame. Nobody was. There's a very good piece of advice I've often found useful. Never attribute to malevolence what is merely due to incompetence. I can't feel any anger towards a bunch of programmers I never knew who've been dead for centuries. We get a reference to cargo cults. During the 20th century, some of the few primitive tribes that still existed made imitation aeroplanes out of bamboo in the hope of attracting the big birds in the sky that occasionally brought them wonderful gifts. To start this bit here, the start of chapter 36, Chamber of Horrors. Some people think this is what's happened with COVID. Uh, history is full of nightmares, some natural, some man-made. By the end of the 21st century, most of the natural ones, smallpox, the Black Death, AIDS, the hideous viruses lurking in the African jungle, had been eliminated, or at least brought under control, by the advance of medicine. However, it was never wise to underestimate the ingenuity of Mother Nature, and no one doubted that the future would still have unpleasant biological surprises in store for mankind. It seemed a sensible precaution, therefore, to keep a few specimens of all of these horrors for scientific study, carefully guarded, of course, so that there was no possibility of them escaping and again wreaking havoc on the human race. But how could one be absolutely sure that there was no danger of this happening? There had been, understandably, quite an outcry in the late 20th century when it was proposed to keep the last known smallpox viruses at disease control centres in the United States and Russia. 
However unlikely it might be, there is a finite possibility that they might be released by such accidents as earthquakes, equipment failures, or even deliberate sabotage by terrorist groups. We get this about the brain cap, which I think is interesting. Soon after the brain cap came into general use, some highly intelligent and maximally zealous bureaucrats realised that it had a unique potential as an early warning system. During the setting up process, when the new wearer was being mentally calibrated, it was possible to detect many forms of psychosis before they had a chance of becoming dangerous. Often this suggested the best therapy but when no cure appeared possible, the subject could be electronically tagged or, in extreme cases, segregated from society. Of course, this mental monitoring could test only those who were fitted with a brain cap, but by the end of the third millennium, this was as essential for everyday life as the personal telephone had been at its beginning. In fact, anyone who did not join the vast majority was automatically suspect and checked as a potential deviant. Needless to say, when mind probing, as its critics called it, started coming into general use, there were cries of outrage from civil rights organisations. One of their most effective slogans was brain cap or brain cop, slowly, even reluctantly. It was accepted that this form of monitoring was a necessary precaution against far worse evils, and it was no coincidence that the general improvement in mental health, religious fanaticism also started its rapid decline. And this is kind of what they used to do the thought writing and things like that. We get a reference to the Enigma project and the work that Alan Turing did to break uh, the Enigma code during the Second World War, which is very cool. Okay, then we get some sources. And so here we get a little bit more on that idea of how much storage space we would need to store a human being and everything they experience. Uh, I was astonished to read in a newspaper on 19th of July 1996 that Dr. Chris Winter, head of British Telecom's Artificial Life Team, believes that the information and storage device I described in this chapter could be developed within 30 years. In my 1956 novel, The City and the Stars, I put it more than a billion years in the future. Obviously a serious failure of imagination. Dr. Winter states that it would allow us to recreate a person physically, emotionally and spiritually, and estimates that the memory requirements would be about 10 terabytes, two orders of magnitude less than the petabyte I suggest. But 10 terabytes is not much. I mean, what's my computer rocking? I've got 1.5 terabytes on my computer. And this was in 96, 30 years in the future, which would put us in 2026. We get the reference of an intellectual as someone who's been educated beyond his or her intelligence. And then we have the acknowledgements. I just want to read this first paragraph because this deals with kind of an urban legend. My thanks to IBM for presenting me with a beautiful little ThinkPad 755 CD on which this book was composed. For many years I've been embarrassed by the totally unfounded rumour that the name Hal was derived by one letter displacement from IBM. In an attempt to exercise this computer age myth, I even went to the trouble of getting Dr. Chandra, Howe's inventor, to deny it in 2010 Odyssey 2. However, I was recently assured that far from being annoyed by the association, Big Blue is now quite proud of it. So I will abandon any future attempts to put the record straight and send my congratulations to all those participating in Howe's birthday party at, of course, the University of Illinois, Urbana, on 12th of March 1997. Says the Oxford English Dictionary uses no fewer than 66 quotations from his books to illustrate the meaning and use of words. And I want to read these final three paragraphs because they're beautiful. He says, Finally, I would like to assure my many Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish and Muslim friends that I am sincerely happy that the religion which chance has given you has contributed to your peace of mind and often, as Western medical science now reluctantly admits, to your physical well-being. Perhaps it's better to be unsane and happy than sane and unhappy, but it is best of all to be sane and happy. Whether our descendants can achieve that goal will be the greatest challenge of the future. Indeed, it may well decide whether we have any future. Arthur C. Clarke, Colombo, Sri Lanka, September 1996. So we have it, 3001, The Final Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. Now, this is one of the later books that he wrote. I've actually read reviews that were far from positive about this, but I really enjoyed it. I think it's one of his better books. Um, I actually enjoyed it probably more than any of the other books in the 2001 uh, Space Odyssey series. Uh, and if you've got this far with the series, you should definitely read it. I gave it a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of 3001, The Final Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.